Sustainability Series. We're entering the third season of this series. My name is Meg Gray. I'm the Science and Technology Librarian here at the library, and I partner with Jessica Burton, the Executive Director of the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative, <laughs> SMCC, <laughs> it sure is, um, to bring this, uh, this series to you. So we meet on the fourth Wednesday of every month, except next month we're going to take a break because it's the Christmas week. So we hope to see you again on January 23rd. We're going to be showing Maine Coast Harvest. It's a series of documentary films on Maine's aquaculture industry. So thank you for being here. Um, after the presentation, there will be a Q&A. I'd just like to remind everyone that the Q stands for question, not statement, and to please be respectful of other audience members. Jess is going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'm Jess Burton with the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. We are an organization that provides a space for land and water conservation organizations to work together for greater impact. We have 19 member organizations, and we're all focused on you know, getting into the future in a better way. Uh, so I am thrilled tonight to um, uh, be here for this event, to listen, and to be able to introduce Troy Moon, the Sustainability Coordinator for the City of Portland. Troy started with the city in 1997 uh, in public, public works. During that time, he worked on a number of different projects, including island services, open space, and solid waste. And throughout all of it, sustainability has always been really important to him. So in 2016, he joined the executive department and started as the Sustainability Coordinator. Um, and is going to tonight present this talk, which I understand is the first time, first of many, I hope, um, opportunities to hear what this great work is. And uh, thank you. So please help me welcome to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, Jess. It's really great to be here. And um, thanks to everybody for coming out. Really pleased to see so many people uh, join us tonight. Um, so basically, today I want to focus on you know, some of the impacts that we're seeing from climate change, um, some of the things that the city has been doing over the last number of years, and then also think about what we might be doing in the future, um, where you probably might have noticed in the paper that we're just beginning our climate action planning process. Um, and so we're gonna, this is kind of like the introductory um, meeting for that, just to get everyone introduced to what we'll be doing um, in the next 18 months. Oops, let's see here. There we go. Um, first thing I want to mention is a little bit about our office. Uh, so the sustainability office in City Hall is relatively new. Uh, when John Jennings um, became city manager about three years ago, he really thought it would be really important to have a sustainability office, and he invited me up to, uh, to be the sustainability coordinator. Uh, as Jess mentioned, um, I've been working with the city since the late 90s, and throughout that uh, time, I've been really involved with a lot of different sustainability projects, everything from solid waste to you know, working in the parks and open spaces, but really, really focused on environmental issues. So I was really pleased to be uh, up in City Hall managing a lot of interesting projects um, that, you know, that John particularly has been really supportive of. Um, and just recently, we were able to uh, add a second person to our office, Ashley Krulik, who's, say hi, Ashley. <laughs> so we're really pleased to have, uh, to have another person in our office. So. Um, but I want to get started. Um, climate change has certainly been on everybody's mind, um, over particularly since uh, the release of the, uh, of the latest climate assessment. And so it's certainly it's something that we've been thinking about in the city for a while. Um, we've kind of collaborated with uh, some of local organizations doing work. We really appreciate the work. Like the Portland Society for Architecture has been a real great leader um, in this area for the last number of years, thinking about how climate change will impact the city. Um, you know, but we're, you know, we're seeing some impacts already. Um, climate change is, you know, it didn't just start yesterday. Um, you can see that over the uh, past decades, we've seen some incremental rise in sea, in sea level um, at the Portland tide gate. Um, but, you know, it's, it, over the you know, past decades, it's been kind of modest. Um, over this time span, it added up to about eight inches. So people might say, well, that's not so bad, eight inches. We can get, you know, we'll have wet feet when we go to U-Haul once in a while or something. But unfortunately, um, it's not going to stay that way. So all the science that we've seen in, you know, projects that sea level rise is going to start happening a lot more quickly um, than it has over the past decades. Um, 
since uh, you know since 2000, uh, records show that uh, the pace has you know has gone up you know three you know three centimeters, and in, in fact in the Northeast it's going to be rising a lot more quickly. So uh, NOAA did a big study um, and released it in 2017, and really upgraded the projections of what we see sea level rise being over the next um, you know the next hundred years, and it's it's pretty significant. Um, so what's it mean for Portland? As a part of our Bayside Adapts project um, that we did last year, kind of a neighborhood scale adaptation project, um, we, co we commissioned some scientists to look at, take the latest data, apply it to Portland, particularly Bayside, and really give us an idea of what we need to expect uh, for sea level rise in that neighborhood and for Portland as a whole. Um, and so by 2050, um, on the intermediate scale, which at this point, I don't think anyone puts any credence in the lower estimates. That, you know, sea level rise is increasing rapidly, so I think the lower level ones are pretty much dismissed at this point. But the intermediate, scale, inter intermediate projection calls for you know, one and a half feet of sea level rise that we need to you know, definitely be expecting, but you know, potentially up to three and a half feet of sea level rise by 2050, which is, which is crazy. But by 2100, we're talking much higher. We need to. We're, we can definitely expect up to four feet, but you know, on the extreme scale, um, which unfortunately more and more people are thinking might be, might be the the reality. You know, ten plus feet of sea level rise. So that's pretty significant. Um, and so, just for example, um, just to put some of those numbers onto a map of Portland. You can see the you know the green is the intermediate scenario, and you know it's like it doesn't seem that bad. But uh, as you look at the the blue, which is the high scenario, and the uh, red, which would be the extreme scenario, the ten plus feet, you can see that there's a pretty substantial impact on the city of Portland. In fact, um, if you overlay the projections um, that you know that NOAA has just released onto old maps of the city. You can kind of see the dark purple is where you know the original, the original you know geography of the city um, was was that you know the Deering Oaks Pond was was tidal and and uh, in the base you know people could sail boats into uh, the Back Cove, um, but you know over time we've filled in um, you know different parts of the city, you know Wharf Street used to be the waterfront but now Commercial Street's the waterfront and certainly. East and West Bayside didn't exist until after 1866, when the Great Fire caused a lot of debris that needed to be disposed of somewhere. But as sea level rises and you know the water comes up, um, you know maybe potentially we kind of see the original coastline recreated. So that's something to think about. Um, and we certainly all have experienced the impacts um, in the last several years. Um, it seems like there's big storms that knock out power. Pretty often, I remember you know being a kid. You know, it was, power didn't go out all that all that often. Um, when it did, usually it was on pretty quickly. But now we're seeing storms that are kind of more powerful and you know, and impacting people. You know, bringing down the power. People are without power for a longer period of time. Um, there's more intense rainfall, which we can expect to get worse. Um, we all may remember a couple of years ago in. Uh, I think it was in September of uh, 2015. There, there was a great big deluge. We had almost six inches of rain in just a matter of a couple hours and you had cars floating past uh, Whole Foods and, uh, and uh, that was kind of the wake up call. I think that really kind of got people's attention that we really needed to uh, you know, start taking some action. And in fact, right after that, the, the city commissioned the Bayside ADAPT study. So it really kind of, that was a great wake up call. And unfortunately, other communities had wake up calls like Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy, which was devastating. Ours was luckily not quite so significant and gave us a chance to really get going. Um, but there's definitely changes happening. Um, you know, we, we now have protocols in the city to barricade off um, you know, a number of streets in Bayside every time there's an astro astronomical high tide or storm tide. Um, and so it's getting to the point now where even the, the police are getting a little, little whimsical reminders of, uh, you know, the people really need to pay attention to the, uh, to the barricades, which come up um, pretty regularly now. And in fact, and here we have a picture from yesterday. One of my colleagues was down on Commercial Street. And so this was a high tide yesterday um, down by Chandler's Wharf. So again, it's, it's happening all of the time. Um, and it's not just getting our feet wet it's, or having some inconvenience by not being able to travel down some streets. 
Um, you know, the Gulf of Maine's changing rapidly. It's warming faster than 99% of any of all water bodies on Earth. Um, we're seeing, you know, fishing stocks declining. You know, the shrimp season's, you know, canceled again this year. And, and you know, the marine industries are really important to the city um, and to the whole region. So that's something we really, really need to think about as we move forward. Um, of course, over the weekend, we, heard, we saw the fourth National Climate Assessment released. Um, I haven't had a chance to read all of it yet, but I've certainly I've thumbed through part of it, particularly the part that affects the Northeast. And again, it pointed out that the Gulf of Maine is warming rapidly. And the Northeast in general is warming faster than most parts of the country. And so regardless of scenario, um, it indicates that we will probably see a 3.6 degree Fahrenheit rise in the average temperature here in Maine by 2050. Um, they also point out that vital infrastructure um, is very vulnerable to sea level rise, whether it be roads and bridges and, and train tracks or electrical infrastructure. You just have to look across the bridge and you see a major substation in South Portland is kind of surrounded by seawater. So that's pretty, pretty vulnerable. Water treatment plants and there's big oil tanks right on the water. So those are a big concern. And also we need to think about, you know, in terms of equity, the people who are most vulnerable to impacts of sea level rise are the people who are least able to, to deal with it, whether it be poor people or elderly folks or people who just arrived in the city or in the community. So as we move forward, think about how we're going to react to climate change. We really, really need to think about how we're going to include equity to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. And you know, so the city's been thinking about this for quite some time, and so we've done a number of projects. So I'm going to try to run through some of the interesting ones that we've been working on for the past number of years. And what's really great about working in the city, there, is, there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of staff members, a lot of departments in the city who, who have found that you know, really sustainability and environmental uh, ethics are really ingrained um, in, in most of our operations, which is really great to see. So we're going to touch on a few things. Um, one area, of course, that's going to be very significant um, is energy. Um, so we've, you probably read in the paper, we're working on some solar projects. Um, well, actually, I'll start with LED streetlights, sorry. Um, so we've actually, so we've begun working on our LED streetlight program, which is just about done. Um, so you can see a map of all the different streetlights there across the city. There's about 5,200 streetlights that we've switched out over the past, uh, past year. Um, we were really, we really tried to be really careful about picking fixtures. We picked some that were, you know, compliant with international dark sky <coughs> standards um, to prevent light pollution. And uh, they're also very, very energy efficient. So we've, the projects actually reduce the city's overall electrical, consum electrical consumption by 8%. Already. Already, which is uh, pretty cool. It was, you know, it was, you know, energy efficiency certainly is, is key to any, any sustainable uh, program. You know, any electricity you're not burning in the first place is more ener more environmentally um, sound than you know produce and, and you know any that you're producing. So we're really excited about the big reduction in electricity. Um, it actually also saved the city about a million dollars a year, which we were also very excited about. And we were the first city in the main to uh, undertake this type of project. And on t on t moving on to solar projects. Um, we've installed a number of solar, over the past year, we've installed a number of solar projects. Um, kind of, this is a, kind of a cool smaller one. All of the golf carts at, River, at Riverside Golf Course are now 100% powered by the sun, which is, which is cool. Um, we uh, have installed the, uh, the landfill solar project, which is a one megawatt array. It will produce about as much electricity as City Hall and Merrill Auditorium use on any given year. So it's kind of kind of close, <coughs> and you know it's ba basically about 1.2 million kilowatt hours a year. And also we have a third a third solar project that we undertook this year at the Portland Jetport, um, which is about half the size of uh, the the airport the uh, landfill solar, and it's actually the largest roof mounted solar array in the state right now. So we're really pleased about that as well. Um, we also have an energy benchmarking ordinance. You probably saw in the paper that it's kind of stalled at the moment, but it's something that actually is really significant. Um, we want to make sure that the, you know, the large properties in the city are really thinking about how, how they're using energy and water in their buildings. Um, you know, basically, if you're not measuring things, you're probably not 
keeping track and, and you know, not able to reduce your use. So, <coughs> so um, you know, the ordinance would be to require all of these, any building with 20,000 square feet or more to benchmark the, their energy use and report it to the city. That would allow us to be able to help encourage them to be more energy efficient or direct programs at them that can you know, help them reduce their energy, energy consumption or reduce their emissions and save money. So we're working closely with the CMP <coughs> to, um, to get that off the ground. Um, and waste reduction and recycling is actually kind of near and dear to my heart. That's kind of, I started my career in public works working on uh, the recycling program. And it's something that Portland residents have done a really great job with over the years. When I first started working for the city, we dispose of about 23,000 tons of trash every year. Um, we implemented the curbside recycling and, and uh, the pay-as-you-throw trash program in 1999, and we've seen some pretty significant results. If you follow like, the blue lines here on the graph, you'll note that we've reduced our disposal rates by about 60%, which is very, really, I'm really pleased that Portland has been able to take that on. So recycling went from you know, under 1,000 tons a year to pretty close to 6,000 tons a year now. So the trajectory is, is on, on the whole, going in the right direction for, uh, for waste and recycling. And since I've been around a long time, I have some old pictures that I like to show off. So this is what trash used to look like 20 years ago in Portland. It was just basically people put out whatever they had and, and dumped it on the curb. So we had a lot of issues with litter and, and just being pretty unsightly. And we had a program also called heavy item pickup. Some people may remember that. Um, it was kind of like a trash fair uh, where people would uh, put whatever stuff they had on the curb. Every council district had a week and it took, you know, <coughs> supposedly everyone had a week, but it always took two months to, to finish that project. So it wasn't really a great use of city resources and also it, was, it encouraged a lot of waste. So last year we rolled out recycling carts uh, to all of the uh, all the participants in recycling here in Portland. Here's a picture of when they showed up. We had about 22,000 22, of them stashed out at the uh, near the airport, getting ready to be passed out. But um, we're really pleased that program's gone really, really well in terms of reducing litter. If you remember from the little blue tubs, every time there was a windy day, your tub would be all over the street instead of in the back of the truck. So the carts have really done a great job of taking care of that. In fact, before the carts came out, we did a study uh, with USM, to, and we determined that over a ton of litter was coming out of the blue tubs every week. So it was really becoming a huge problem. So the carts have solved that, which we're pleased with. And you're also, also familiar with our green packaging ordinances. So if you go to Hannaford and you forget your, forget your bag, you have to pay five cents to uh, get a new shopping bag. Um, and we've also... Um, Ban polystyrene containers like you know coffee cups or or takeout trays, and really the uh, the point of doing that was you know you know water quality was huge. Um, everyone most a lot of the projects we do in Portland are related to keeping trash and litter out of Casco Bay, and certainly the green packaging, both the uh, polystyrene ban and the bag fee were designed to keep litter <coughs> excuse me out of the out of the bay. But both of them have been really successful. Um, back when the program first started, Hannaford mentioned in the press that they were seeing 80% of their customers bringing in uh, reusable bags, which I hope it stayed that high. It might, it might have slipped a little bit, but still, I mean, for me, just having the cashier ask people if they wanted a bag rather than just stuffing things into it was a big win. So, so um, we're really good, really pleased with how that's going. This is, uh, we call it the Gorilla Cage. It's out by Kapisic Pond. But this is a big outfall for uh, storm water. And so we can see litter from recycling, uh, dog waste bags, etc. cetera. Um, anything that goes in the street eventually goes into the catch basin, which eventually goes into a local body of water. And so here's an example of um, what happened, you know, some of the things that get caught in the grates. And, you know, if it didn't have a grate, it certainly would have just gone right out into the water. So. Um, when we, we were showing you know, folks on the Green Packaging Task Force and certainly the city councilors um, this picture, it really helped emphasize you know, what the issue was that we were trying to address. Um, so stormwater, I mentioned stormwater is a huge issue for us. Um, we're really trying to uh, improve um, you know, both stormwater and wastewater. 
Um, here's a, this is a picture of um, a large conduit that was installed in the Bat Cove. You may remember a few years ago, uh, we had closed the street for the whole, most of a year. And we put in a two million gallon storage conduit. There's going to be five of these, excuse me, in the city before we're done. Um, but they basically catch the first inch of rain, um, which is the most polluted of any storm, and capture it and store it in these containers. And it, where it, then once the storm subsides, it can go to the water treatment plant and, and be treated before it's discharged into the bay. And so we have a lot of, well, you know, we've been working on reducing the number of uh, com combined sewer over overflows and go down to about 30, um, which is less than half of what we had originally. But and so they're basically, in this type of old system, a lot of old cities have this. Um, all the storm water goes, all the storm water goes into the same pipe as the sewer. And in a really heavy rain event, it overflows and just discharges directly into the water body. So this is what we're trying to get rid of. Um, we're not just doing pipes, though. We're also doing rain gardens. You might notice that there's a back cove. It's kind of the largest rain garden. But we're deploying these around the city. On the left-hand side, um, that's off of Clifton Street. But you can kind of see how it works. All the water just sort of goes down into the pond area and, and infiltrates um, into the ground as opposed to just flowing off into the water bodies. Um, land care, we, you know, our parks department it does a really great job of taking care of uh, the parks and open spaces. I'm really, really impressed with what the folks at the golf course are doing. Uh, Gene Parati is the superintendent out there. And he's, um, you know, since we've been talking about reducing pesticides, he's really taken it to heart. Um, he's reduced his pesticide use by over 60%. So he's created a system where they only need to apply pesticides on the greens and just in a limited amount on some of the fairways only as needed. But he's also jumped in with both feet for he has beehives all over the course. And he's got um, button boxes for birds. Um, they're working on being certifi an auto certified Audubon um, facility. So. Hats off to Gene. He's doing a great job out there. Um, as you probably know, we have a ban on synthetic pesticides. Um, it goes into effect uh, for private property um, on January 1st. It's already in effect for city property. But basically, it says you can't use uh, any synthetic pesticides on your property. We're really promoting organic land care practices. And we'll be doing a lot of work over the next you know, later this, uh, you know, basically starting the first of the year will really be um, getting the message out for folks to think about how to do their lawn, you know, in a more environmentally sustainable manner starting this spring. We've already talked to a number of the, the you know, the uh, lawn care companies and getting them on board, but this is a, it'll be a nice change. Certainly South Portland already has this ordinance as well, so you need to be a kind of a critical mass around, around this area. Another thing that's really cool in our parks department is, uh, promoting urban, you know, urban meadows and wildlife habitat. And this is a, kind of the most obvious one. Um, if you're on Washington Ave, looking up towards East End School, you'll see um, you know, the slope there moving up towards the school. Uh, we have the Mountain Joy Orchard, which is an urban um, apple orchard. Um, it's run entirely by volunteers who do an amazing job of keeping it up. And we have um, the wildflower meadow on the left there that's been strewn with uh, plants Mostly native plants that are really friendly for um, pollinator habitat. And, and then we, of course, have the community garden, the North Street Community Garden. So it's really cool. It's, I'm really excited about this. It's really taken off. I think at this point, um, if, you know, if someone decided they wanted to mow the, mow the hill, I think people would be outraged. We've really kind of taken, taken to that. And, and they were ado we've adopted the meadow habitat in other parts of the city, too, like Franklin Street, the median. That, might only, that only gets mowed occasionally. Just to allow so you to get more habitat. And mobility, of course, you probably noticed um, we have the um, new bike lane on, a, on um, Park Avenue. That's a, a pilot program, um, seeing how that's going to work out um, for people. We're also looking at different ways to um, promote um, mobility with technology. So we have um, on Forest Avenue, we have um, some smart traffic signals. Um, they're the first um, adaptive traffic signals installed in the state. So basically, they uh, detect traffic from very far away, and then they react um, in real time to the, the, to the conditions when vehicles approach. They, uh, they have an algorithm that makes the light cycle in the most efficient manner possible that um, will reduce wait times. We've seen, so far, they're deployed at Morrill's Corner. We've seen wait times at the lights reduced by 20%. And we're currently, as we speak, actually installing the, uh, 
some additional, um, additional units on Forest Avenue, basically everything from uh, down by the CVS Plaza um, up back up to Morrill's Corner. Well, all, all those signals will be, will be the smart signals and they'll all be able to communicate with each other. So we're really hoping that um, we'll see some much more efficient traffic on Forest Avenue. And <coughs> excuse me. Why that's important from a sustainability perspective, you know, um, cars that aren't sitting at the lights idling are certainly not putting out as much greenhouse gas emissions um, and they're not you know, polluting the air around the neighborhood. So we're really excited about that. And uh, we're also working on autonomous vehicles. Um, Commercial Street, if you've ever been down there on a sunny um, summer day, which I'm sure you all have, it's, it's, it's cramped. There's lots of cars, there's buses and trucks. A lot of conflicting uses on Commercial Street with the heavy marine industry and, and everything else going on. So um, we need to figure out a way to get fewer cars um, on Commercial Street, encourage people to you know, take alternative forms of transportation or, or, uh, or just walk. But also, so we're imagining right now we're working with a company called Inrix. It's a technology company that works in the, in the transportation sector. We're mapping the um, mapping all of the regulations on, uh, on this corridor, basically Forever Parkway on Commercial Street and then up Franklin Street. So all the signs, all those lines, stripes, all, the, reg all the, you know, the written rules about how vehicles operate are basically creating a, creating a data set that future autonomous shuttle will be able to reference. And uh, so we're imagining, you know, maybe in the next couple of years, I'm doing an RFP for an autonomous shuttle that would be able to, to move between remote parking um, lots, maybe, you know, the, so maybe start at the transportation center at Thompson's Point, move down to like Angelo's Acre, which is kind of right at the end of High Street, then over to, uh, over to uh, the Casco Bay Lines and up Franklin Street. So encourage people rather than drive their cars down into uh, Commercial Street to take this shuttle. And one thing that makes it more important is that you know, we have a lot of companies, you know, three, three firms starting, you know, opening office buildings on the east end of Commercial Street, bringing maybe 2,000 new employees uh, to the waterfront in the next year or so. So thinking about different ways to get people in and out of Commercial Street um, without taking cars is definitely a topic we're thinking a lot about. And you know, bike, bike routes and byways. Um, really, you know, we're, you've seen more and more uh, bike lanes around the city, and we're kind of signing off particularly you know good routes through neighborhoods that maybe parallel some of the busier streets, just to create ways that people can get around the city uh, more effectively. And we're getting ready for bike share. We have a bike share ordinance in place. Um, several co bike share companies are interested. I think it's just a matter of time before we see. Um, bike share here in the city. And certainly our planning department is, I, I think they're a really progressive group of folks. Um, we just did our comprehensive plan last year um, that really, um, they, were, they did a great job of having a lot of public engagement. They met with people, you know, they, their, their philosophy really was go to the people rather than require people to come to them to provide input on the, on the master plan. And I really like their uh, their uh, kind of the mission statement was, you know, they were dealing with, you know, Portland's equitable and sustainable, dynamic, secure, authentic, and connected. And I think that's as we move into our uh, climate action plan, I really want to take a page from the work the planning department did um, on, the, on the comprehensive plan and, uh, and really take that, take that lesson forward. As we start thinking about climate action, this is a quick look back on some of the history We've done so. The, the city did its first greenhouse gas inventory back in 2001, and that was my first kind of sustainable project. It was doing the first uh, greenhouse gas inventory. We updated that in 2005. Um, in 2009, we had kind of had a green ribbon committee um, that issued the uh, Sustainable Portland Report, and in 2011, um, we proclaimed um, the council made a proclamation to support planning for sea level rise. Um, so there's been some time in between, but we're really kind of now kicking things into high gear um, for our climate action planning process. Uh, last year, the city council adopted some pretty significant goals. Um, they, re they decided that the city should operate on 100% clean energy by 2040. And they adopted a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. And so these are pretty significant goals. 
and we're going to have a lot of work to do to figure out how to get there. Um, so just for instance, um, in 2006, we had, uh, 2005, we had, we were, you know, this is just for the city, this is city operations, not for the community as a whole. We had, uh, we emitted about 26,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. Over the intervening years, we've managed to get that down to 17,229, which is, uh, again, a 34% reduction. I'd like to say that it was because we were all doing awesome things, but a lot of it became, a lot of it's because we switched all of the city buildings from oil to natural gas, which is a great step. It certainly reduced emissions a great deal. Um, and also the grid um, in New England is cleaned up immensely. So that accounts for, we have, you know, we've done some great steps in making buildings more efficient, but really most of the, most of the savings came from, from the fuel switch and from the grid being cleaner. But uh, just for instance, um, most of our, uh, most of our emissions come from um, 34 percent from electricity, 48 is from buildings, heating buildings, and 17 percent from, from driving vehicles. Uh, as you see now, in 2016, natural gas is the largest component of our, um, our emissions, uh, electricity, followed by electricity, which is 34 percent. So buildings, and uh, so basically, you know, for the city operations, buildings is really our, is our big deal. Um, but what does 80% reduction look like? Um, just to give a little context, so you can see that, you know, we have a graph here, 17,000, you know, tons of CO2 equivalent, and then we have to get, if we were to meet the 80% inside of our city government, we have to get that down to 3,400 tons, so that's a, that's a big jump. And so on the community scale, we'll be updating our community greenhouse gas emission during the climate action planning process, but I'm sure we're gonna see a similar kind of large gap of like we need to move from, from huge to, to almost nothing by 2050. Um, so when the, uh, when the council wanted to um, make, you know, they wanted to commit to large reductions, um, it was, became clear we needed to have a, a really good plan and I have a great colleague on the other side of the river, uh, Julie Rosenbach, and we were talking and we thought it would be much more effective if we uh, worked together on a, on a climate action plan for both Portland and South Portland. And the, our, both uh, our city managers and the city councils both thought that was a great idea. And so we're starting the process of uh, getting that off the ground right now. So we did an RFP <coughs> for uh, some consulting help. We had Amazing response. Um, we had, uh, you know, we had firms from all over the world, really top-notch uh, consulting firms applied to uh, to partner with us to do this project. We ended up picking a kind of a, a group led by a company called Linnean Solutions, who has offices here in Portland and also in Cambridge, um, and they partnered with uh, Kim Lundgren Associates, um, which is another Boston-based company, uh, Integral Group, which is they do outstanding work on energy issues. They developed the Cambridge, Massachusetts Net Zero Energy Plan. Um, Woodard & Curran, which is a, 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 you know, a good size uh, engineering company that we, they do a ton of work in Portland. They know Portland infrastructure better than anybody, so they're really well positioned to help us um, think about how to move forward. And also Carl Epic, who's a, a planner who's worked in Portland for, uh, for many, many years in the transportation sector. So we're really excited about this consulting team and uh, we're just finalizing the contract with them, and we'll have that signed shortly, I'm sure, and we'll get started. But what's really important um, as we think about this climate action plan is we, you know, we talked a little bit about all the doomy and gloomy things. We're going to have sea level rise, and, and you know, the oceans are, are warming, and we're having some problems there. But this is really an opportunity for us to act now, because how we, how we respond now will impact how bad things get to be in the future. It's not like if we don't do it by X date, you know, we have to stop doing things. It's like, we, it's a continuum. We have a choice. Um, the sooner we take action, of course, the, the less dire outcomes will be in the future. But we have an opportunity to kind of imagine what we want our future to be in Portland and South Portland. And that's kind of how we want to approach the climate action planning process is, what do we want our community to look like? You know, certainly we're gonna have challenges. Um, we'll have to address sea level rise, and you know, looking back to the Bayside Adapts project, we asked, uh, we had a design challenge. We asked um, some of the firms here in Portland to imagine what Portland might look like, what Bayside might look like um, by 2100. And people brought some really, really creative ideas forward. Um, 
how do we adapt to the, the impacts of climate change, but you know, make the community vibrant. So here's an example of one of the designs um, one of the firms submitted as part of the challenge, you know, a tide gate across Back Cove, but also doubled as recreational facilities so that people could paddle in, in the Back Cove or they could, you know, run the rapids as the tide left the, the Back Cove. So I think it's an opportunity for us all to be really creative, to think about, um, you know, how do we, you know, we have a great city, a great quality of life. How do we maintain that? How do we, how do we make it even better, maybe, even as we move forward? And there's definitely things that, everyone in the room can do, we all can do, um, to you know, bring that future about. And certainly one of the most important things we can do is you know, talk about how climate change is going to affect the things that you care about. Because it is going to affect pretty much, you know, if you have a hobby, it's going to affect it. If you have an interest, it's going to affect it. If you like birds, you know, you're going to see different bird species. Or if you're a gardener, um, you maybe you need to grow different plants. Or you know, this really, this impacts to pretty much every part of um, you know, the ecosystem. So there's probably something that, that somebody cares about that's going to be affected. So let's talk about that. Let's make climate change something that, you know, it's a topic of conversation you know, regularly. And certainly we want you to participate in the climate action planning process that will be getting started soon. Um, so stay tuned to uh, the city website and to um, our Facebook page and Instagram. So we encourage you to sign up for those. And I think also it's important to get involved with um, community organizations that are doing great work. I mentioned the uh, Mount Joy Community Orchard. This is like all volunteer groups, and they you know they take care of the orchard and uh, they do a marvelous job. And it's, you know it's a great amenity. Um, there's like any number of different groups that people can involve with to build the community. You know, a connected community is a resilient community. So if people know their neighbors, they know. Um, you know, other people across the street or down. You know, other people in the city who share their interests. It helps knit the community together. So whether you're interested in you know the bay with the friends of Casco Bay or your neighborhood association or the friends of one of the parks, um, it just I think it's to promote community involvement and engagement is I think it's a really important part of our, of our effort. And with that, I guess I'll wrap up my talk and certainly appreciate your attention and happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Um, one is about Roundup. Uh, yeah. You listed it as a pesticide, but I think it's actually an herbicide. Yeah, no, we kind of use it interchangeably. So the, or, the ordinance we passed prohibits herbicide. We defined it as herbicides and pesticides oh, as, yeah, so. Okay. The other one is, can you explain why uh, our waters are rising and heating up more than other areas? Well, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure. We all know entirely. Um, I certainly don't know all the answers to that, but the data is certainly showing that. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Troy, how will uh, citizens of citizens be invited to participate in the climate action plan? That's a great question, Alan. Um, so, um, you know, again, we're gonna we'll be we'll be doing announcements on the on the website and uh, I'm sure press releases, um, Facebook page. Again, our goal is to, again to be out in the community. I'm sure we'll have some more organized meetings, but we're kind of wanting to go where people are too. So, I think you'll see um, tabling and you know visiting people's meetings that are happening anyway. Um, if there's a group that wants us to go talk to them, we're going to do that. So. Um, it's going to kind of open invitation to um, to participate. Um, you know, reach out to us um, and say, "Hey, we want you to come talk to our group. Uh, we'll we'll be happy to do that." Yes. This may not be sustainability. Yeah. But what about municipal Wi-Fi? Municipal Wi-Fi. So we have actually have a small foray into it. Um, if you were over here in Monument Square. We have public Wi-Fi available there, and also in Tommy's Park and Post Office Park, which is down in the Old Port. So it's kind of a pilot project. Um, so um, it's been going pretty well. Um, I think maybe we'll do um, a few more locations. I'm not sure we'll do it um, citywide. Um, there's a lot of changes coming up in the telecommunication industry. I think you're going to see 5G um, really soon, next several years. Um, so. I'm not sure if Wi-Fi is like they're going to be the best investment over the next number of years, but we definitely want to do some of it, 
and um, kind of in key locations where it will be most impactful. Uh, Heather. Uh, first of all, thank you. I think it's really great that Portland is making this such a strong initiative. I'm really proud of that. Um, and that we're the first city in the whole state of Maine. Um, to answer this woman's yeah. question, I'm a research scientist, and oh. I would strongly recommend to you that you check out the section of the recent released climate report that Andrew Pershing at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, as well as other research scientists here in the Gulf of Maine have contributed to. That'll probably help you understand um, how we're trying to answer that kind of really complex, complex question. Um, and now my question for you, yeah. um, I'm always looking at the root cause of greater problems. Mm -hmm. And one of them I see is in any big city, especially one that's really growing and attracting people here for jobs and also facing space problems mm -hmm. and housing and now climate, um, it seems to me that the root cause is really lack of integrated transportation infrastructure to actually reduce the overall big, bigger problem, which is too many cars and too many people, getting them off the road. But I see less, I see the metro working, I see less people using that transportation resource. Um, are there any integrated um, initiatives with the city to partner with metro in trying to make things come together a little bit more for the transportation mm -hmm. puzzle? So, I think it's a great point. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, we've certainly seen, um, one of the things I really like is um, the fact that like, in the school department now, all the high school students get a metro pass instead of a yellow school bus. So to me, that seems that it's creating the, the transit rider of the future, getting people accustomed to riding, and you know, the bus ride, you know, if you ride bus when you're younger, you're more apt to want to ride the bus in the future, so that's that's a great that's a great step in the right direction. Um, but again, I mentioned before that we're getting more and more activity on the peninsula, so you know it's kind of in its nascent forms. But I think we're looking at different partnerships with, with Metro and other agencies to try to in, make that more integrated and to promote more alternatives. So it's you know I'd say we're in the early stages, but definitely we're thinking in that direction. Yes, sir. I attended a, a meeting here last month that the Press Herald put on regarding uh, commercial real estate. Yeah. Very enthusiastic about uh, the, pro pro uh, you know, the prospect for East Bayside. Yeah. I stood up and asked the question, who's thinking about climate change here? Mm -hmm. With a 10-foot rise, the building that you're building now is, is, is going to float away. And, and no, one, no one had thought about it. They said, oh, somebody, somebody in the city's going to be getting back to us on that. Oh. <laughs> So well, it's, it's, it's really kind of shocking to me that this kind of money, like the Wex building, mm -hmm. is not sustainable. It would seem. Yeah, um, it, you know, it's certainly, you know, it, it's a it's a big question, um, and you know, I think as we move forward, um, and you know, developers, you know, need to think about that as well as the city. Um, this, you know, um, it's a tough question, um, and people need to start thinking. Definitely need to start thinking about it. Um, but shouldn't the planning office? Yeah. Step in here and say you can't do it. Well, um, I guess it's, I guess I guess it's not quite that easy. Um, but you know, it's a it's a great question. Um, I don't have a great answer for you right now. So, yeah, John. Yeah. Um, other than Portland and South Portland, yeah. are you aware of any other similar efforts among other towns and cities in the Portland area? Um, as far as we, you know, in terms of developing climate action plans, I think, you know, we're the, we're the ones doing it at the moment. Um, in fact, I think we're, I can't find any examples of other cities collaborating on a, on a climate action plan, so that's kind of cool. Um, but I know a lot of our neighboring communities are looking at it. Um, they'll be watching carefully. And the reason we wanted to do it together is to, to build some, you know, regional relevance. Um, a lot of the things we're going to need to do are going to be similar or the same. There'll be definitely some different things because our communities are a little bit different. Um, but, you know, but there's a lot of overlap. And if we can start creating um, some models for, for regional action, I think that's going to have a greater outcome than people, the cities just doing it on their own. So. Um, yes. Either ones. <laughs> Troy, back to the transportation yeah. question. What is the argument in favor of doing the electri the autonomous vehicles on that corridor as opposed to, say, hiring drivers to drive in electric vehicles mm -hmm. on a regular schedule? Yeah, um, 
I mean, I think partly it's, uh, you know, I think in the industry in general is moving towards more autonomy. Um, I think we'll see it in the future, we're gonna see more, more autonomous vehicles, you know, hopefully electric. Um, but certainly that could, could be an outcome. Maybe there's an intermediate step of, uh, of shuttles with, with drivers. Um, so that's, that's a possibility. My question is, you have these pretty ambitious goals, which I applaud for the 2015 reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. When I'm looking at your pie chart, and like almost, you know, almost half of it is coming from the heating buildings, yeah. um, how is any insight into what the city's planning to do there? Are we talking about like enormous retrofits of insulation, or uh, heat pumps, or heat pumps hanging off the sides of the building? Um. So we don't know entirely yet. Certainly energy efficiency is going to be essential. Um, but we have, uh, you know, we have, you know, it's not just the city buildings that have this problem. We have, the, you know, Portland has very old building stock in general. So um, it's, going to be, it's going to be harder than in cities with newer building stocks. Um, but it's so it definitely um, looking at all, all the options available, you know, insulating where we can adding heat pumps. In fact, we just put heat pumps in city council chambers as a, you know, as, as a step in the right direction. Um, but um, yeah, energy efficiency is gonna be super important. And just as a follow up to yeah. that, what's, how does uh, historic preservation feel about some of the issues? And not only the city buildings, but also in the private buildings. Yeah, um, so my, you know, my experience with, um, with is HP is, you know, they've been, Pretty accommodating in a lot of cases. Um, I think you know they want to make sure they you know protect the character of the buildings as much as they can. So, um, so I think you know then we'll certainly work with them moving forward. It'll, they'll be, I suspect they'll be a part of the of the climate action plan that will address um, historic character while, while moving forward with more sustainable building. Um, but you know from f feedback I've gotten from some folks who have gone through the process, they found that they were you know receptive. Um, maybe there's things that we could, you know, improve on there or do it a little differently, but um, I think that they're willing to look at that. Um, yes, um, how is the new plan committee going to coordinate with the state? We now have a governor who is much more forward-thinking mm -hmm. and there will be changes. I know the building code, um, there's issues with the building code statewide versus yeah. what the city can do. How are you going to um, we'll be really interested in working with the state for sure. Um, right now, there's a lot of discussion around energy policy, particularly. Um, that's something that um, I've been particularly interested in. Um, but you know, I'm not sure what their you know what the state's plans are for kind of a unified um, approach. I mean, the, we used to have a state planning office that kind of was a clearinghouse for that sort of thing, but that was dissolved a number of years ago. So I don't know if there's any thoughts to bring that back. Um, but, you know, we work with um, the DEP. They have a sustainability unit, the DEP, so we work pretty closely with them. Um, we'll continue to do that, and uh, we'll work with uh, we'll state as, as much as we can. I mean, um, certainly, you know, we need every level of government to, uh, to engage on climate issues. So you, you mentioned a regional approach on, from Cape Elizabeth as the chair of the Energy um, uh, Committee in, in that town. Is there anything formally <coughs> afoot to, to coordinate? Um, I know that GP Cog is um, interested in working on climate issues too. Um, so you know, we, I haven't reached out particularly to, to anyone specific in Cape personally, um, but I know that you know they work with GP Cog, and uh, we're you know we'll certainly be cooperating with uh, our regional government folks. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about that. Yes. Um, so I saw that 80% by 2050 for the municipal government. That's that's community wide. Um, that's community wide. Okay, it was, that was one of the fast that. Yes. So, um, and and what I heard from the UN report about the 1.5 degrees was mm. they were saying it needs to be 50% for the world by 2030. Mm. And so I'm wondering, like, does this? Do you feel that the planning process, national plan? is aggressive enough. Like 80% by 2050 seems really good. Right. Like if we get to 50% by 2030 on the way to that, mm -hmm. what we're, that's on target. Um, but do you feel like it's gonna be sort of scaled at that period? 
Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we haven't. I think as we go forward with it, um, you know, the science indicates that we need to make as much, you know, progress as quickly as we can, uh, move towards renewables in the early time frame. Um, I think we'll look really closely at that. Part of the project will be to set intermediate <coughs> goals that we can start achieving. So um, I think we'll try to, you know, find ways to um, move to renewable energy as soon as we possibly can. Um, so, but yeah, it's going to be intermediate, you know, it will be definitely, we'll set goals that we can achieve in the short term that will lead us towards the, to, towards the larger goal. And we'll try to calibrate those to be the most impactful. Yeah. Uh, I'm, in, I'm interested in the conversation. Um, so you're, you've been with the city for quite a while mm -hmm. and you've certainly had many conversations about this topic. And, um, you know, what have you found to be one of the best ways to address any pushback or questions about why some initiative um, that has proceeded, mm -hmm. maybe initially got some pushback? Is there any one thing you do, or if, if you could speak to that a little bit, that would be great. Um, I think it's really specific to the issue. Um, but as a whole, I think um, Portland is Portland residents and, and have been really receptive to uh, to the initiatives we've undertaken. Um, you can see, like recycling, that was you know Portland residents have really embraced recycling and waste reduction, which is. And I remember back, you know, when they started the uh, pay as you throw with the blue bag system, there was definitely some skepticism about it, um, but it really sh showed its worth. That, you know, providing some financial incentive to avoid making waste, and kind of the same model we used with the you know, the bag fee at the shopping center. Um, so I think. Um, you know, our experiences and, you know, people have been, once they understand why we're, why we're, we have a policy or why we're trying to do something, um, that it's pretty well embraced. So, uh, I think we're lucky to live in a community that really has a strong green ethic and really cares about these things. What about, and also, sorry, just within the city, the conversations that you might have also uh -huh. with, like, your fellow mm -hmm. city folks? Um, you know, I'd say, you know, certainly, you know, cost is usually something we talk a lot about. We have limited resources in the city, so we need to be mindful that initiatives we undertake um, are good uses of tax dollars. Um, you know, and also, where are we achieving policies that have been established by our elected officials? And certainly climate, working on climate is one of the policies that our elected officials have said is important for us um, to begin working on. So, you know, we really followed that policy direction. And, and we were really pleased that we have a, you know, administration and, a, and elected officials that are really supportive of, uh, of environmental issues and um, particularly on climate. So, someone else had a hand up. I have a question just about um, whether there's been discussion about um, having city collection of compost. Um, yes, there has definitely been some discussion about that. and. Um, I think, you know, to achieve really high, you know, waste diversion uh, rates, I think that's something we need to do at some point. Um, last year, we actually issued, uh, issued an RFP uh, to see if we could get bids from companies to do the service. And it was just, you know, it was cost prohibitive at that time. So we're trying to look at different ways um, that we could, could do a collection that would, you know, be cost effective and fit in the budget. Um, in fact, we traveled, uh, I had the opportunity to travel with EcoMain. We went to uh, Scandinavia and saw some technology there um, where they, you know, residents can put their, put, their, um, tra put their food waste in a, you know, a green bag that went in with their regular trash and then got sorted out at a plant, um, which worked really, really well. We, we went to uh, five cities in Scandinavia that were doing it and it's pretty successful. So that's something that we're, we're, we've looked at and working with, you know, EcoMain, you know, which is our regional waste handling agency is kind of the leader on that. Um, so we're definitely thinking about it. Um, it's going to be important. I think we'll do it at some time. Um, we just need to find the right way to do it so we can make it cost effective. And we have to... uh, I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, I'm aware that Oslo is saying that by 2025 years or something, all cars have to be electric. Yeah, 2025, mm -hmm. all cars have to be electric in Oslo. Yeah. Is there any um, push for that? Um, so I think that's a national policy in Norway, um, not just the city. Is it just the city? Well, um, we haven't actually considered that at this point. So. And now, now, uh, South Portland, I know, has plug-in spots. 
Portland. So we have a few, um, though some of our, park, our city parking garages have, um, charging, have charging stations. Um, but so in the next phase of our smart city project, um, we're looking at having addition, have, installing additional electric uh, vehicle charging stations in some key places around the city. So it's in, it's in the works. Okay, and then really quick question. Who gets the five cents for the plastic bags? So in our ordinance, the stores keep the five cents? They do. Yeah. So, you know, the, really the intent was to provide some financial incentive to the, cu the customer. Um, and so ideally, the five cents, the, it's a revenue stream that declines over time. So um, we made that decision to go f to have the stores keep it. Yeah, Alan. I heard that uh, there was some uh, effort to look at electric buses uh, here recently. I just wonder what the result of that might be. Wow, how do they look at this point? So Metro is getting two electric buses um, pretty soon. So, um, and so they're getting two buses and the, and the charging infrastructure to go with them. So um, and they're not, I'm not sure what the delivery time frame is, but that's in the works. So we'll be seeing two new electric metro buses in the not too distant future. So hopefully that's just the first one. Um, I have another question just about, I mean, there have been a couple questions about transportation and about development. And I'm curious, and you say, you know, there is everybody who's an elected official in here is like very pro sustainability. And I guess there is, I'm curious as to what you think the steps are to kind of reconcile that with a lot of sort of parking lot development ideas and, um, and how do we, you know, solve that transportation question and the develop, like how do we sort of bring sustainability into the development part of that conversation? Yeah, no, it, it's it's a tough question for sure. I mean, you know, we're you know, we're a city, you know, in a in a state, you know, in a regional environment. Um, so you know, we have you know, and people you know are coming. People live in people. A lot of people work in Portland. They live outside. They travel to Portland. Um, so we want to get them out of the cars. We'd like to see them take public transportation, but in, in the short term, you know, and maybe hopefully not too long into, into the intermediate term, they're going to be driving their cars to the city. You know, tourists are still coming. We want them to, you know, take the bus or take the train. But a lot of people are driving. So in the short term, we're going to have traffic. We're going to have. We need to do something with cars. But you know, we need to think about how do we move away from that. So um, again, it's it's a it's a tricky question. You know, it's, I don't think we have a, a you know the best answer at, at this point. But it's something we're working on and struggling with. So. Is there one more question. Yeah. Have you guys considered implementing superblocks? On any part of the peninsula? Um, what is that called? Super blocks. Um, so, you want to explain? So, she was asked if we have thinking about implementing super blocks. On the, and so, I'd say probably no uh, at this point. Um, um, you want to explain a little bit more about what that is? Uh, yeah, so it's just a designated area. Um, within a city where only bikes, well, walking paths, or public transportation can actually use the roads in those areas, so no cars. So, yeah, so, I mean, our, our foray into like a car free zone, we have like on Sundays on the boulevard in the summertime, we block, we block that off to vehicles. Um, so that's the kind of the, the regular, you know, you know car free. So, and so we haven't really you know, considered you know, that, that concept yet um, on a large scale. So. Thank you so much, Great. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>